Today, I'll be installing the cheapest one-ton mini split that I could find on Amazon in my home gym. Some may say that climate control isn't necessary in a home gym, and while I understand where you're coming from, it isn't the human parts of Texas. Don't get me wrong, I love working up a good sweat. I'm just, it's all sweat under here. This is just sweat from here down. But drenching my equipment every workout is not ideal. Not to mention that the mini split that I'm installing today also has a heat pump so it can keep me warm in the winter. My insulated garage gym is about 336 square feet with 10 foot ceilings, so I opted for a 12,000 BTU unit. This will be my third mini split install, so I feel like I'm starting to know what I'm doing, but I must say that as a disclaimer, I am not an electrician or an HVAC technician, and this video is for educational purposes only. Step one is going to be running the electrical for the unit. Step two will be pouring a nice concrete slab. Step three will be actually installing the unit itself. And at the end of the video, I'll go over the performance of the unit in the garage gym, as well as the cost of the install. So with that, let's get started. All right, so we're up in the attic. These are the doors that come up. This is the wall that I'll be putting the mini split on. And then this right here is the outlet that is in the garage. In order to splice into this line, we're gonna be using two of these junction boxes. We'll cut the line in the middle, and then we'll run a stringer in between the two boxes. And then from one of these boxes, we'll run to the mini split. This is a nice way to splice into an existing circuit that doesn't put a lot of tension in the line as if you just splice directly into it. And it also gives you a nice box to run additional lines off of. I obviously turn off the breaker to do this work. However, I still like to check the lines with a non-contact voltage tester just to be sure. This is a 20 amp circuit for the outlet in my gym which I think will be more than adequate for this mini split. Normally I'd like a dedicated circuit, but I've read that the amperage draw on these little splits is actually pretty low. At the end of this video, I'm going to be testing the inrush amps of this unit to get an idea of how much power it draws. As you may have noticed here, I made a little right angle bracket out of two two x fours to mount this junction box cleanly above the top plate. I've used this double box method frequently in my attic and it sure is handy when tapping into an existing circuit. I plan on adding some additional lights to both my shop and gym and will be employing this method for sure. Once the wiring is done and tucked away into the box, all you need to do is install a solid faceplate. On the other box, I just needed to connect the new lead that runs between the two boxes to the existing line coming out of the wall outlet. I crawled over to where I'll be dropping into the wall and drilled through both top plates with an auger bit. So quick recap on the electrical, coming over here right above the outlet, uh, we have a splice into that circuit with two boxes. Uh, we basically cut the line and then we ran the line between the two boxes. The outlet goes into this one and connects and then all three connect together with the load coming in at the bottom here. And then this line goes to our mini split. So following this line around here, we're actually dropping in to an outlet box right here. This is what I'll use to run a ring camera in the gym. And then we're coming all the way around to the hole that we just drilled in the top plate. So the reason that there is a junction box here is because I didn't have a long enough wire to make the entire run. So we'll splice in a second wire, come out of this junction box, go through that hole in the top plate, down the wall, out of the building, and into a safety shutoff box for the mini split. In order to easily run my Romex through the wall, I'll be drilling some three and a half inch holes in the drywall. Later, I'll come back and patch these up. The bottom hole is going to be the inside mirror to the safety shutoff box on the exterior of the building. I then went hunting for the support stringer between my studs, made a three and a half inch hole below it, and then drilled through it with the auger bit. In order to easily fish the wire through the stringer, I drilled a hole above it as well. All right, so we're about to start the fishing process here. I am just taping up the end of my wire to my fishing tape, my metal fishing tape. So now that we got this guy taped up, we're going to stick it through the top plate here, try to contact that support stud, then go downstairs, get it through that hole, and get it all the way to the bottom. Yeah. All right, I'm going to go down there and see if I can grab that. This is our hole above the cross support. All right, I definitely found it. <clears throat> We're gonna pull it through. I put a hole through this stud right here, this cross member at least, it's not really a stud. And I'm gonna go ahead and poke this fishing line through that hole. And I guess the nice thing about having a hole under is that I should be able to pull it through here. Let's see. Yeah. 
You can see it coming through the bottom. I'll go ahead and get this pulled and then I'm gonna pull it all the way down to this third hole. All right, so we're down here. I'm gonna go ahead and pull this guy through. I'll cut the fishing tape off of it and then we're gonna be exiting the building through the brick. The goal here is to take this long hammer drill bit and put it through our wall, exiting the building through the brick. And this will act as our pilot hole for our core bit that will be putting a full size hole uh, to run this wire through. I purchased these cheap masonry coring bits on Amazon a while back when installing a car charger and they've really performed well for me. I'll have them along with the other tools and supplies I used in this video affiliate linked in the description below. Once we have the Romex through our hole, I put a box connector onto it. Note I ground the screws of the box connector short so that they will fit in the hole I just made in the brick. I then affix the connector to the box and fill the hole with an insulating spray foam. Using some Tapcon screws, I connected the box to the wall. The wiring to the shutoff box is simple. You just need to connect your ground to the center and then your load and neutral wires to the middle terminals on the terminal lock. To repair the drywall, I cut some strips of wood to act as backers, inserted them into the holes and screwed them in on both sides, and then attached a whole pucks to them in the middle. I later came back and puttied up the gaps, sanded, and then painted these holes. The cool thing about this method is that if you take your time, you can't tell anything happened in those spots. Naturally, when pouring the concrete pad, you want to pick the hottest part of the day to minimize your comfort. I have this 2x3 frame that I made out of 2x4s for my last mini split install that I reused on this project. These three metal stakes were used to hold the frame level when pouring the cement. I'm for sure not a cement pro, so if you're going to be pouring a pad for your project, it could be worth doing some additional research. I laid down some pea gravel, compacted it with a brick, put some rebar in there, which I elevated, and then started mixing bags. I used three 80 pound bags in this project and actually ran a little short. I should have purchased an extra 60 pound bag to have on hand, but alas, hindsight is 2020. I wasn't able to screed across the top of the frame, but I managed to get it fairly level with a hand trowel. After about an hour of dry time, I came back with a magnesium float and an edging trowel to get this as pretty as I could. As I mentioned at the start of the video, this is basically the cheapest mini split I could find on Amazon for my needs, so I won't be expecting many frills. The units I have installed in the past have had nice cardboard cutout templates and more detailed instruction manuals, both of which will be lacking in this little split. But with that being said, you'll have everything you need to get this guy installed. This adjustable stand is purchased separately, and I like to get it set up to the right length early in the project so that this adjustment doesn't slow me down during the install. Before we can mount the interior unit, it needs to be wired up. This step is pretty straightforward on most mini splits. All you gotta do is remove the access panels and feed your control whip through the back of the unit. Thankfully, the wires on the control whip are clearly labeled. Connect each wire to the corresponding labeled terminal for the ground, the 3S wire, the 2, and the 1. This is how the interior unit will both get power and control the outside condenser. One thing I noticed on mine is that the plastic tabs in the cover were broken. While this is annoying, I don't find myself needing to access these wires anytime soon, so I just put a piece of tape across the top to hold it flush. Before mounting this bracket on your wall, I'd advise taking measurements indicating where the copper refrigerant lines will be in relationship to the mount. For me, they landed about four inches over from the right set of mounting holes. This measurement will allow you to accurately target your hole in the wall. If you can hit a stud for mounting, that's great, but for my case, in order to have it centered in my room, I was forced to use drywall anchors. Considering these interior units are very light, this is not an issue. When drilling my refrigerant pass-through hole in the drywall, I encountered a support stringer in between my studs. While not ideal, I simply just moved the mount down about three inches and drilled another hole. All right, so this one sent me a slight curveball. I measured that we are about four inches over from the center of this mount and almost flush with the bottom for our hole. But we're gonna put a three and a half inch hole here. But the first time I drilled it, I hit this support stud, or that's going side to side between the studs at least, this little uh, support stringer. I forgot that uh, these walls had these. I actually hit it over here when I was doing the electrical, but I didn't measure like I should have. So I brought this whole thing down a few more inches and uh, I got me another hole in the drywall. And I'm putting a hole in the OBS, but before I'm all the way through, I use that center hole as a guide uh, for a long hammer drill bit so I can exit the brick and come around to the other side to put in my full size hole and brick. But this keeps me centered uh, on when I get around to the other side, it lets me know uh, where to drill. 
Like the other core bits, I picked up this big boy from Amazon for my last mini split project. And while it's cheap, it does a great job getting through my brick walls. Note that you want to slightly slope these holes downward towards the outside of your building to aid in drainage. I like to install a piece of large PVC through these holes because it feels like it adds a layer of professionalism to your install. It likely helps protect your coolant line bundle and it helps keep the wall cavities separate. I mark the PVC on both sides and cut to fit. When doing this, I also put some indexing marks on the wall and PVC so I can line it back up appropriately after the cuts. Now it's time to carefully bend out the refrigerant lines and then bundle them with the control whip and drain line. I like to wrap them here, not necessarily for the insulation, but because it makes it easier to poke them all through the hole that we just drilled. Overall, this interior install came out cleaner than my last one due to slowing down and taking some thoughtful measurements. On the exterior of the building, we're going to be bending these lines downward. I wish this unit came with a slightly longer 3 8 of an inch line because getting it pointing down without kinking it was very difficult. One nice thing about using a line cover kit is that it gives you some extra space to work with and this bend will be covered up and look nice afterwards. When I'm ready to connect the refrigerant lines, I remove the plastic end caps. These lines were holding some trap pressure, which is a good sign. I assume this is something like a nitrogen purge to keep the lines clean and reduce kinking when bending. I applied some nylog to the mating surfaces before making the connections and used my torque wrench to tighten them. Based on previous experiences, I got nervous that I was going to over tighten as I got close to the called out torque settings. I erred on the side of caution and used my gut while making some of these connections. Maybe my torque wrench isn't calibrated spot on or something like that, but it feels like I was going to ring off some of these connections if I kept going, especially on the quarter inch line. With the upper connections made, I set the condenser on the stand and installed the rubber mounts that came with the stand. Initially, I hooked up the lines and coiled them behind the unit, which is how these units are designed to be installed for DIYers. This prevents the user from needing to add new flares to the copper. They're also pre-charged for these specific line lengths. However, personally, I think this looks bad and I haven't had any issues with the previous two units where I adjusted the line set lengths. If you're going to be cutting and flaring your own lines, I highly suggest picking up the specific flaring kit over the run-of-the-mill kits that you can get at big box stores. It's a much higher quality, reduces the chances of messed up flares, and can flare both imperial and metric line sets. I'll make sure to cut these lines in such a way to provide a little extra slack in case I have leaks and need to reflare. When connecting the lines, I hold them straight and then snug down the nuts with an adjustable wrench initially to keep everything aligned. Like the upper connections, I started off with a torque wrench, got nervous, and ended up going by feel to snug them to my liking. If I do another install, I'm going to get my hands on a different torque wrench to see if this one is just not accurate. With the lines connected, I hooked up my vacuum pump to the test port and ran it for around an hour before shutting off the pump and letting the system sit. Alright, it's been about five hours, still holding the vacuum. It's a weekend, so I won't be going to get the nitrogen for the positive pressure test. I'm going to wing it and just release a little bit of coolant into the system and uh, use that pressure to check for leaks. Uh, we'll, we'll only release probably about a two second release just to get pressure in there to make sure that we don't have any leaks in our connections. And then we'll go ahead and open it all the way up. I didn't see any leaks after lightly charging the lines, so I went ahead and opened everything up. With the refrigerant lines done, I moved on to the electrical. Once again, I decided to use a pre-made whip for this install because I found it was cheaper than making my own whip with conduit and THHN wire. We'll use the red wire on this pre-made whip as the neutral. It probably would be good to label this wire in the box as neutral for anyone who ever takes a look in the future. While the 10 American wire gauge wire is bigger than we need for this application, everything fit just fine. The nice thing about many of these mini splits is that you can remove the cover and make your cable gland connections to this little mounting plate during your wiring process and then add the cover back at the end. It's a little tight in here with our 10 gauge wire, but I found that the 10 gauge yellow connectors worked just fine in this condenser's terminal block. To add the connectors, I'm using a ratcheting crimper from Klein Tools and I can't recommend this thing enough. For anyone who's messed up crimps in the past, this little tool here is a godsend and removes all the guesswork in the process. With everything hooked up to its appropriate terminal, I reinstall the cover and engage the crossbar in the safety shutoff box. All right, so we have the refrigerant released into the system. 
The unit is now wired up and plugged in and all that's left to do is press the power button and see if she turns on. So I have my trusty remote here, fingers crossed. Hey, and it turns on. That is a good sign. It looks like it has started cooling. Just so we have a reference, I have this monitor on the wall here. It says that we are at 83 degrees Fahrenheit and 54% humidity. So we'll give it a few hours and uh, see how this unit performs. While we're waiting for the gym to cool down, I did a little cable management and stand mounting. I really wish this six foot whip was an eight footer or that I was able to mount this box a little further to the right, but it is what it is and I was able to get everything looking decent. I used some quarter inch tap cons to mount each of the four feet of the stand down to my slab. Only one of them torqued off and broke for some reason, so I rotated the foot and re-drilled. Maybe I hit a piece of rebar or something like that on that specific anchor. We have this meter set up to measure the inrush amperage. And uh, we're going to wait for this outside condenser to kick on. There we go. Just kicked on. Alright, we're almost at 5 amps. All in all, that seems like a real gentle start. These must have some sort of soft start built into them. Normal operation here, just reading the amperage of the unit cooling is around 3.6 to 3.7. So yeah, this has a fairly low amperage draw while it's just running. This unit has the ability to be remote controlled via an app over Wi-Fi, so I went ahead and got that set up. This is a feature that I use a ton and I like being able to build automations to have the unit turn on and off at specific times. All right, so this thing's had about four hours to run and I don't think this meter here is very accurate. It says it's 78 degrees at 42% humidity. But if I come to the middle of the room where my air bike is, and I have this meat thermometer sitting on the air bike, this is reading about 70. I think this is more accurate because it feels pretty cold in here. I'm gonna put this meat thermometer up into the vents. Yeah, I'm seeing high 40s. So yeah, this thing's blowing some pretty cold air and it's getting very cool in here. It feels comfortable, way more comfortable than it was before. It definitely cut down the humidity as well and uh, it's perfect to work out in here. One negative is that my power rack cross members are in the way of some of the airflow depending on the angle of the vent. So I'm trying to get the angle just right to kind of uh, split in between those. I was going to put it higher, but I ran into that support stud and lowered it by about three inches. So, you know, is what it is. Seems like it's still working pretty good though. So this place is much more comfortable. All right, so now we're going to go over cost. What I'm considering to be the direct cost of the mini split came out to around $722. When you add in things like tools, concrete, and electrical, I got that number up to around $1,100. ChatGPT told me that the average cost for a mini split install is somewhere between three and $6,000. So I think we're money ahead here. If you're gonna be doing a mini split install like this one, check out my other two mini split installs on my DIY channel, Redbeard Engineering. I'm super excited to have this unit in our gym and I know that it will just make this space more comfortable for myself and my family. I have a long list of gym upgrades coming up so if you want to follow the journey, make sure to subscribe. Until the next time, train hard.